Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to the Morgan Lecture today. Um, the lecture is being funded by the University Lectures Fitch Fund, the Kinesiology Marsh Center, and for any undergraduates that are here that are part of the Kinesiology Club, the Kinesiology Club as well. So we want to thank all of the, all of the organizations for supporting the Morgan Lecture. Um, this lecture was established to honor the contributions of Dr. William Morgan. Uh, Bill was, affiliate, was affiliated with the UW for about 35 years. He's widely recognized as the founder of the contemporary field of exercise psychology. Um, he founded and was the first president of Division 47 of the American Psychological Association, which is the division of exercise and sports psychology. Um, also, Bill um, established the graduate program here um, in the area of exercise psychology. Um, he led a vibrant and active program. He published more than 150 papers in peer-reviewed journals, as well as seminal books involving sport and exercise psychology during his career. His research was supported by extramural grants from the National Institutes of Health, the United States Olympic Committee, the Sea Grant Program, and the U.S. Forest Service. Um, Bill received numerous awards and honors during his career, and some examples include the American College of Sports Medicine Citation Award, a Certificate of, of Appreciation from the United States Olympic Committee, a Medal of the Swedish Society of Medicine, and a Certificate of Appreciation from the U.S. Army Research Institute. I'm very glad that Bill and his wife Grace are here um, today. Bill and Grace, would you would you wave to the crowd? <laughs> Our speaker for today is Dr. Ray Glenn, who is a professor in the Department of Kinesiology at Indiana University. He comes from Hoosier land, but I know down deep he's a badger at heart. Um, he received a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. He then completed a master's degree and a PhD degree in sport and exercise, in sport and exercise psychology from our program here. So he's um, part of the alumni organization. Um, and a notable aspect of his PhD work is that he won an outstanding dissertation award from the Division of 47 of the American Psychological Association. I just learned that within the last two days. Um, Jack has over 100 publications, including research papers, book chapters, proceedings, and technical reports. He has given numerous national and international presentations, including symposium and keynote presentations in England, Scotland, Japan, Sweden, and Germany. He has received numerous invitations as a visiting professor. For example, um, he was a visiting professor in the Department of Psychology and Sports Sciences at North Anglia University in England, um, as well as the Department of Sports Sciences at Kobe Gakuin University in Japan. And, and he was a visiting research fellow in the Division of Biological Psychology at Stockholm University. Um, Jack has fellowship status in multiple professional organizations, including the American Academy of Kinesiology and Physical Education, um, the American Psychological Association in both Division 47, as well as Division 30, which is the Division of Health Psychology, and he's a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Raglan. Uh, and also his legacy on the field as a whole, and I think you've just gotten a little bit of a taste of that. 
And uh, this is the slide, Billy will recognize it. So this is me as a, a young or younger professor at Indiana University. There's Bill, and to his left is the late uh, Lynn Updike, who is uh, an associate dean in our school at Indiana University. And he also was uh, Bill's uh, dissertation advisor at the University of Toledo. So there's uh, two generations of uh, my legacy, academic legacy, standing to the left of me. Well, I came to the University of Wisconsin in the fall of 1981, and uh, I uh, didn't realize what I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know what Madison was like in August. <laughs> and, uh, I, yeah, there's that. I still have my original ID. And it didn't work in the front door, though. I, uh, I also didn't really realize what the field of exercise in sports psychology was about. I mean, I came and I interviewed. I read a couple of Dr. Morton's papers. I'd actually read about uh, him from his work in uh, an issue of Psychology Today from a couple years earlier. But it wasn't until I got here and got involved in research that I really understood there was a lot more to the field of exercise and sports psychology than what I thought. And what I thought was working with athletes, using psychological and motivational techniques. And one arm of his research that I really became involved with and continue to be is really the spectrum of physical activity, uh, going from no activity to, as I'll talk about later, people who get too much. And this was something I had really no concept of, but one of the reasons I didn't have much concept of it is that this work was all really pioneering, all through Dr. Morgan. And one of the first things I learned about was the topic of exercise and hearing. Um, way back in 1977, uh, Dr. Morgan wrote his first academic paper on this issue, adherence to physical activity, and in it, he pointed out something that was, it should have been obvious to people, but it wasn't, and that is that we really knew very little about why some people uh, adhere to exercise where other, other, others discontinue. And he was the first to point out the um, almost behavioral truism that roughly speaking, 50% of people who start an exercise program uh, will soon quit. So that was true back in 1977, and it remains true today. Uh, his main student who works in this area, and I'd say his, in terms of academic legacy, was uh, Rod Dishman at the University of Georgia. He's published two edited volumes on exercise and adherence, and he pointed out in his first book that before 1977, when uh, Bill published his first paper, there was just a smattering of papers on this topic. But you can see, the year he published it, and soon thereafter, it was uh, a big change, and the, the field of exercise uh, adherence um, really took off, and, and that's attributed to his paper. Uh, I've been a member of the American College of Sports Medicine Program Committee, that was 20 years ago, I remember, and at that time, I would see all the psychological papers coming in for the annual meeting, and we would get 10 or 15 at most that dealt with exercise and exercise adherence. Today, I would say that 15 to 20% of the entire program concerns exercise adherence or exercise behavior. So this is an academic legacy that's really uh, changed, I would say, the field of sports medicine as a whole. Uh, this this enlargement of what we think is important and looking at recreational, not just uh, sport types of exercise. And if you do a Google search, uh, his student, Rod Dishman, is the leading uh, science scholar uh, in the field. So he reaps the rewards of that academic legacy. Uh, another topic that I learned about and have become very interested in and continue to do research on is the topic of exercise and mental health. And again, back then, in terms of the concept of sports psychology, this was really off the map. There were very few people who were looking at exercise and its psychological consequences. The, by and large, the vast majority of the field focused on traditional sports. And I learned that uh, through Bill's work that exercise had profound effects on uh, mental health disorders that plague our society, such as depression and anxiety. He actually published the first controlled study on exercise and depression. And uh, most of my work involves uh, looking at anxiety and emotional well-being. And while I was here in the program, Bill published uh, two edited volumes, which I was uh, very lucky to have a role with. Um, in fact, my first two papers in this field were in uh, exercise and mental health. So for me, it wasn't something that I just learned about and became aware of. It was a, a topic that I uh, actively pursued in terms of research. And another part of that legacy is that uh, Bill introduced me to other um, scholars in the field. And this is Dr. Hagel Martinson. Bill, you'll recognize him. He's uh, the pioneering uh, 
exercise, you might say, psychiatrist, he, he did the first uh, published study looking at the use of exercise for not only people with elevated levels of depression and anxiety, but people who had uh, clinical diagnoses and were actually hospitalized. And that work was very influential. So I did a quick search here, and it turns out that uh, Bill is uh, still the most widely cited person in the area, and, and I clogged myself up to number two. All those extra credit projects that I make my students do where they have to do searches on my name, obviously. <laughs> so I'm going to continue that as extra credit projects. So, uh, and this is really a mainstream area in the field. If you're interested in uh, exercise and sports psychology, today I would say all the academic positions that I see listed, uh, the main criterion, what they're mainly interested in is exercise behavior and exercise and mental health. And I, I, I really view that as Bill's legacy. But the area I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk is something that really intrigued me, and that's the role of psychology and training and particularly overtraining with athletes. So we're moving to the upper end of the spectrum. And before I get into this, I will say there's another paper that Bill published that I wanted to talk about, or at least mention. That is, he published the first paper on uh, addiction to physical exercise way back in the 1970s, and he called it negative <coughs> exercise. And it was a very, very controversial piece for a lot of reasons. But today, I think it's widely recognized as well. That is a real problem. What I was even more interested in is the consequence of intense athletic training on the mental health of athletes. And the issue there is what we call overtraining syndrome. Uh, back when I was a student, we called it staleness syndrome, and, and the classic name for it is stale, but I learned that that was a controversial and a problematic term. So my, my colleagues in Sweden who I've worked with, they said we can't call it Staleness syndrome in our papers because that translates into moldy bread syndrome. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't have the same impact. So overtraining syndrome won out. Uh, as defined by uh, a lot of athletes, it, it's basically a condition of chronic fatigue that athletes experience because of the training they do, and it results in underperformance that lasts for a long period of time. Uh, typically, these athletes have to be taken out of training. They need medical attention and they need psychological attention as well. And so it's a very serious problem, and it affects roughly 10% of athletes who undergo a period of hard training. So if you think about a swimming, uh, college swimming team, they train for six or seven months for one meet, essentially. And roughly speaking, one out of 10 of those individuals will experience some uh, signs of overtraining or, or a, a total bout of it, a fully vulnerable overtraining. So it, it's not rare. I like this. Definition, it, it's older, I'll show you how it momentarily, but I think it's very insightful. So uh, it says here that the dividing line between good training and overtraining is often not recognized until it's passed. Not until there's a perceptible loss of vigor, a loss of weight, insomnia, and some other symptom, which in reality is the outward manifestation of some profound disturbance of normal function, does the trainer notice that the athlete is getting a little stale. Uh, this description, oh, which I should point out, uh, it's almost 120 years old. Points out that, that we've known about this problem for a very long time, and I think this early description really encapsulates the challenges of overtraining syndrome. Because basically, by the time you recognize it, it's too late for the athlete. They have to be taken out of the sport, they need to recuperate, and that recuperation can last weeks, if not months. One of the challenges of overtraining is it really is sort of a perfect storm for bad things to happen. On one hand, you have coaches. John Urbanicek was the coach of the University of Michigan team, a swimming team for many years. He said, how do you get to that line and not cross it? If you want to get the best out of the athlete, you have to push the limits. It's the X factor in coaching. So on one hand, we have coaches that are pushing athletes to their utmost extreme. That's one source of the problem. Conversely, we have athletes who are perfectly willing to go in that direction. So here's a quote saying that athletes instinctively realize the record is accessible. They tell themselves, all I've got to do is train harder. So these unusual circumstances, I think, uh, potentiate the risk for overtraining syndrome. Well, a lot of research is focused on trying to prevent this from happening in the first place. And by that, it's the idea is that you can identify early warning signs or markers that occur in the beginning stages of overtraining syndrome. You could intervene more simply by backing off on training, by giving the athlete a few days of rest or using some other form of recovery, and then you don't have to take them out 
they don't descend into Foley bones over Chinese syndrome. And the vast majority of this research, not surprisingly, has focused on physiological measures. In other words, identifying a, a blood test or a cardiovascular test that would be an early warning flag. And at that point, you could intervene uh, easily and, and quickly. And in one review, they identified over 70 causes of <coughs> So there are lots of benefits. Now, I will point this out, that the affected athlete does not exhibit all 75 of these symptoms. And they aren't symptoms here. I got tired of writing them in, so I threw some words. So don't try to read those. Um, the, uh, it'll be a subset of symptoms. And the subset can differ across different athletes. And even if one athlete experiences successive bouts of overtraining syndrome, he or she may not even exhibit the same symptom. So we have this problem with the variety of symptomology. Second, uh, all the reviews of this topic say that these physiological measures don't work very well. Even heart rate, which is the, the classically touted uh, marker of overtraining syndrome. So elevated or delayed heart rate responses or uh, changes in heart rate from when you go for a prone to standing position. You see all this variability there. So it doesn't work very well. So we have a problem. We have this serious condition but we don't have any really effective ways of assessing it. Well, um, when I uh, started at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Dr. Morgan was in the middle of a series of studies, primarily with the men's and women's swimming team. And uh, Jack Pettinger, the coach of the men's team when I was there, he passed away recently. And he and um, Carl Johansson, I couldn't find a good photograph of him, unfortunately, were uh, extremely helpful. We would not have gotten anywhere except for their cooperation. I will say part of that was that they had degrees from Indiana University. <laughs> Which they were, yeah, uh, underdog counsel, and they had PhDs, so they were very sophisticated coaches. But, uh, so what this is, uh, ended up being is we were assessing the psychological responses of these and other athletes to their training mode. And uh, oh, there's uh, one of our my uh, graduate student cohort, uh, Dr. Patrick O'Connor, who's at the University of Georgia. And, Kelly, I got a picture of you. <laughs> I, I had to dig far and deep for this. But to, look at those acid wash jeans. <laughs> Pat, on the other hand, he looks like he had an accident. So, <laughs> anyway, um, so I got involved in this research, and, and it uh, culminated in the first uh, published study, uh, which really was a series of studies that were summarized in this uh, uh, 1987 paper. Uh, before then, Nobody had published anything on the psychology of overtraining. And uh, I'll talk more about it, but there are a lot of very systematic finds that, that were yielded from this. Let me tell you a little bit about the instrument that was used. Um, not that you're gonna have to use it, but it's important. It, this was a measure, it was a validated measure of mood, but it wasn't developed for athletes. And, and that's another departure of Dr. Morgan's research from others. Uh, a, a lot of sports psychologists like to invent their own tools, and, and they tend to not work very well. Uh, this is a, a validated measure of mood, and it asks you to respond in terms of a smaller window, how you've been feeling the last week, so it, it provides a certain degree of sensitivity, which works in this situation, and then yields a specific mood factors, tension, depression, anger, vigor, which is a positive factor, fatigue, and confusion. And then you can add all the negative factors up, subtract vigor, add a constant, and you get a total measure. And, and Bill actually, um, it wasn't part of the instrument. You created this, and uh, now it's part of the game. And all the descriptions of the poems and, and the, uh, the uh, textbook that goes with it, uh, they actually use this now. So that's another innovation that, that came out of the lab. So we use this measure to see how these athletes were feeling during their training. And let me summarize uh, sort of the, the general findings here. And this involves research with uh, college swimmers. And what you'll see first is their training mode. And they started September, a little under 4,000 meters, which for them is easy. Uh, for most master swimmers, it's the peak of what they do. But that's just where they start. And month by month, there's these successive increases until they're peaking in December. And if you know about swimmers, what happens is they take them away. They're doing two days, uh, four to six hours in the pool, and they do dry land training in between. Their whole day is spent training. Following that, there's a very long systematic paper more so than any other really competitive sport. The, the training periodization in swimming is really far more developed, I would argue, than, than uh, other endurance sports. And so what we did was that in each of these training phases, 
we assess how the athletes were feeling using that profile of loose space. And first I'm gonna show you the responses of healthy swimmers. So by healthy swimmers, I mean these are swimmers who by the end of the season, their performance improves. And typically, just six months of training is set up for one competition if their performance improves by two to three percent, that's a successful season. If it's more than that, it meant the athletes were out of shape to begin with. Now you don't expect to see much. What was found here was this, it was a very systematic relationship between how hard the athletes were training and how they were feeling. So you increase the dose of training, there's a concomitant elevation in mood disturbance. So the more they train, the worse they felt. And you can see with the paper, they start to uh, respond, and by the end of the season, they're feeling as good as they did at the beginning of the season. Now for me, and other people, that's kind of curious, because wait a minute, exercise has been demonstrated by Dr. Morgan's research and others to improve emotional health. And in almost all cases, it does, except if you're a competitive athlete, and then it does exactly the opposite. In fact, this relationship is far more predictable and precise than the exercise and mental health benefit dose response. We don't know an awful lot about what's the optimal dose. Here we know exactly what's going to happen. Now we're going to look at a group of athletes that end up becoming overtrained. And what we see is at the beginning of the season, they look just as good as the rest of the team. It's only when you reach a point where the training is becoming very difficult that they start to over respond. Their mood disturbances are far greater. They're going into the early stages of overtraining syndrome. And you can see that even if you taper and reduce the training, they're not responding well. So a reduction in training is, is not going to help these athletes. They have to stop training. So what we found here, unlike physiological measures, is that one, the mood of athletes responds to the training, but there's a distinction between athletes who are tolerating the training and those who are having problems. And, and this was pretty profound because, again, the, the physiological measures that have been long tested could not make this distinction. And uh, census work, which is all at the University of Wisconsin, we and others have uh, replicated it with uh, groups of swimmers and other athletes. And I would say, my argument is, is that you will always see this relationship except in two cases. One, the athletes are not training hard enough, or two, they're lying about how they feel. Yeah. Otherwise, it has to happen. Well, um, one of the things that we learned by doing this is that most of the POMs, the profile mood space responses, were in this sort of dose response manner. So here, I'll actually use my, this is total mood disturbance, which I just talked about. You can see it going up and down. Here's uh, POMS fatigue, which is one of the subscales, also going up and down is the other scale. Bigger is a positive factor, so it goes down and up. So everything is responding to the training, except for one factor. And that's tension, which is the same as anxiety. It did not respond the same way. It's, it's going up, as it is, if I set up, sorry. Uh, it, it goes up in response to the <coughs> training. I'm not even, it's, it's, there we go. But it, it does not go down in response to the taper. So our conclusion here was that these changes in this particular mood space factor were both reflecting the stress of training and also we feel the stress of this all important upcoming competition. And at first I meant, oh, well, the stress of competition is going to compound the problems with these athletes and maybe increase their risk of overtraining syndrome. But then Dr. Morgan introduced me to uh, a field of research and some papers that changed my perspective on this. And this was a, a way of thinking about the anxiety sports performance relationship that was very, very different than the traditional models and approaches that were out in the United States by and large. And so uh, the zone of, uh, individual zones of optimal functioning model suggested that anxiety could have different sorts of effects on athletes. And in some cases, not only not necessarily bad, but good. So this, one of the points of this model is that it suggests and predicts that the optimal zone of anxiety associated with optimal performance can range from low to high across athletes. In other words, for some athletes, high anxiety might be good. And that's like, oh, well, that's different. And I will say that this theory was largely unknown in the United States. There was a, a Russian psychologist named Yuri Hanin who was uh, judiciously publishing, but his work was completely ignored in the US. Uh, the other thing about this theory is it said, well, the other part of it is that optimal zone for a particular athlete has nothing to do with the sport that they're in or their skill level. It's entirely uh, free ranging. And, and it's very different from traditional theories that say, well, if you're in this sport, weightlifting you should do here, and if you're an archer, you should do here, and 
Dolly Drop model says no. Dolly started becoming interested in this model for its own sake, but also to try to make some sense of some of the uh, overtraining research. And, and through Dr. Morgan, I got to meet uh, Dr. Hanin, who uh, was the author of this, uh, the Eyes Off model, and uh, we've actually uh, published together since then. And here's an example of what we found that supported this work. And uh, these are all studies of female track and field athletes. This is one of Dr. Morgan's studies with uh, US Olympic runners. And then we have uh, college track athletes, division two track athletes, and nine foot cross girls. And what these bars show are the distribution of athletes who either do good with low ranges of anxiety, moderate, or high. And so in each case, we see that there's not a clumping but there are some athletes that need to be relaxed, some athletes that do well with moderate levels, and just like what's predicted, and most provocatively, I think, a large subset of athletes who actually need high anxiety. And for me, it's like, well, that complicates then this dose response mood relationship that we see in athletes who overtrain. It means that for some of them, tension is not uh, going to harm their performance, they actually need this. And a couple of years ago, uh, Dr. Hanin and I published a, a review of this whole literature, and we found that in 1988, uh, the number of papers started increasing. And that was the year that Dr. Morgan and I published, I think, the first um, Eyes Off paper that uh, Hahn was involved in. And so now it really is uh, one of the major theories. Uh, when we first started doing this research, you would never ever see it described in any sports psychology textbook ever uh, for a lot of reasons. Now it's in all of them. So I did a search, and yes, my students came through again. I'm actually, yeah, they, they get a lot of extra credit. <laughs> well, anyway, this, this dose response relationship between uh, training and mood, the example that I showed you was with swimmers who their training changed gradually over a period of months, and, and that fits with a lot of training paradigms. But for a lot of athletes, the changes in training are far more drastic. So for instance, with Olympic athletes, they'll typically go to training camps. And when that happens, the day they get to the camp is the day training changes, and training changes very, very dramatically. And so what we've done here is that we've looked at this sort of small window. In other words, these day-to-day -day changes. And what we found is that the, the closer you look at this relationship, the more that's revealed. Really, it's, for me, it's an area of research that just keeps on giving. And I think partly because it's so complex. So here's an example of a study where we took a group of swimmers. This was uh, Dr. Pat O'Connor was the lead author on this. And we increased their training by 50% over a one day period. So they were already doing about 8,000 yards and the next day we had more than 50% more of it. So that's a big boost there. And we measured how they felt in terms of their mood state on each day. And what we found was that within 48 hours there was a significant elevation. So in other words, their psychological responses uh, change very, very rapidly if the changes uh, in training are also rapid. So it's a, it's a sensitive instrument in that regard. We also looked at things like cortisol and, and other blood measures, and those change a week and a half later. So that there's a, a lag time for a lot of the physiological factors. And so for us, this meant, well, the instrument is both responsive and sensitive, which suggested to us that it could be a, actually a practical tool. There's another reason why I think this tool has uh, some practical utility in terms of helping athletes, and that is that we find that these athletes not only show greater elevations in mood disturbance as they become overtrained, and here's an example from three studies. So these bars represent the, the change in training that we see in mood disturbance when you take athletes from easy to hard training. So at the beginning of the season to the peak of the season. And for athletes who are healthy, remember those are the ones whose performance is improved, there's a modest elevation in mood disturbance. Whereas you look at the overtrained athletes and they show far greater elevation. So there's a, a quantitative distinction about how badly they feel afterwards. But what we also found is that there's sort of a, a qualitative difference as well. So what I'm gonna show you here are changes for each of the specific profile mood state factors, fatigue, vigor, tension, and so on. And we're gonna look first at a group of healthy athletes swimmers, as you start at the beginning of the season, how do they feel, how much of these mood factors change at the peak of training? And we see that there is a difference. The, the factors that are affected the most are fatigue, which goes up the most, vigor being uh, a positive factor, that change actually decreases in scores. And we see successively smaller elevations for these other factors. So in other words, it's not just mood that's being affected overall, there's 
pattern chart. And not surprisingly, these sort of physically related factors are the most important. Now let's look at a group of athletes who develop overtraining syndrome. And what we see here, not surprisingly, unexpectedly, is that they show greater levels of mood disturbance for almost all the factors. But the pattern's different. So it's not like the same stair step at a higher elevation, so to speak. Uh, different things are happening. Most obviously here is depression. It goes from being the least influence factor to the greatest in the case of these overtrained athletes. And uh, depression really is a psychological hallmark of, of overtraining. Uh, in the original 1987 paper, it was estimated that roughly 80% of overtrained athletes exhibit clinical depression. And these either medication, counseling, and even in severe cases, uh, hospitalization. So that depression is very serious. And it's just this paradoxical thing. Wait a minute, exercise can be a very effective way of treating depression. In some cases, it equals the benefits of medication, but if you change the dosage, you can actually uh, create clinical depression in at least some individuals. Uh, why that is, it's hard to say. Well, what this has led to are some attempts to uh, use this mood state profiling in a practical application, that is, have athletes train, assess their mood, and based on how they feel, make adjustments to their training to try to keep them healthy and also make their training effective. Uh, there have been very, very few studies uh, that have done this, and I want to share a, a couple with you. And the first was the original study that was done uh, here at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, it was actually sponsored by the U.S. Olympic Committee, and it was done with the men's and women's swimming teams. So, so here's what we did. We assessed uh, the teams during their uh, three-week uh, hard training period. And the, these are their profile mood state scores for each of those states. And you can see as the training progresses, in general, there's a, a systematic elevation. There's a, a couple dips here that reflect the uh, days off. So that the, the training is making them feel worse. What we did off priority is decide that we are going to intervene. Uh, we are going to intervene in two ways. So there's a lower zone, which is the daily mood state average, minus half the standard deviation. And then we have the upper zone. And it was decided that if there was an athlete or more who was in this upper zone, we would intervene. So in this case, if we had an athlete whose score exceeded the rest of the team by half the standard deviation on any given day, we would relay that information to the coach, and the coach would reduce the training until the athlete felt uh, their mood state score fell within the acceptable range. Conversely, if there was an athlete whose mood state scores were too low, they would have to do more training. The idea there was is that they were uh, adapting too well to this and they could handle a little bit more stress. And it turned out that interventions in both directions were very, very common. Some athletes in certain cases had their training lower in certain parts of the training and then increased and vice versa. But I would say this is probably the only example of a sports psychology intervention that I've ever seen where in some cases you are telling the athlete, you've got to feel worse to do better. <laughs> in other words, you're looking too good. We're going to make you train more. Uh, it, it, the thinking is always, no, no, we have to make you feel better. Uh, so it's a, it's a very different paradigm here. Uh, here's what was found. What was found that uh, in the preceding 10 years, uh, these are the average rates of, of overtraining. It would be around that 10% mark, but for the year we intervened, uh, there were no cases in the year after that when they went back to their normal training paradigm, it went back up to 12% again. So we felt that this indicated this was a, a successful intervention. You know, it wasn't a controlled study. We didn't have the numbers to do a, a non-intervention group. Um, but it was, I, I think, uh, the findings were uh, in the direction we expected. There, there have only been two replications of this that I'm aware of since then. And one of the reasons uh, is that the athletes don't like to fill out questionnaires. So any ex <laughs> exercise and sports psychology students in here? You know, people say, I'm going to go into that because all you have to do is give questionnaires. It's so much easier than doing the other stuff. But in the fall of study done to this with, with Norwegian and national level uh, canoeists, they all said at the beginning of the study that they'd rather give blood. They said, we are happy to give blood samples on a weekly basis. We don't want to fill out these questionnaires. So that's, you know, that's, that's not atypical. By the end of the, the season, though, they actually decided the questionnaires were worth filling out and they wanted to do it. So it's not so easy. Well, I mentioned that the, the closer you look at this, the, the more you find. And so we're going to zoom in one additional level of magnitude. 
and talk about recovery, at least a little bit. This is an old quote by Hubris, but I don't think much has changed. So he says, relatively little is known about the rate and state of recovery, and unfortunately no simple and easily attainable variables are available to obtain insight into the recovery process. Because most models of overtraining now, they say, it's not only the hard work that can lead to it, it's the lack of recovery. And the question is, what do you mean by recovery? And what is it other than you know, sleeping? Or So there's a lot said about recovery, and there's actually, I think, very little being done about it. So we decided, well, let's look at recovery, at least in a simple circumstance. And so this was a study that I did with my colleagues in Sweden with the Junior National Kayaks. And uh, if you don't want anything, you know, anyone know about race kayaking? It's a brutal sport. So you're out there in the cold lake, paddling away uh, for hours a day, and then you win your medal, and nobody cares. I mean, anyway, now that's the Swedes care, they do, but nobody else knows. But, uh, and it's very, very hard training. And so we decided to look at their mood state in, in kind of a different way with something that we called the energy index. And I'll show you why uh, we came up with this. Because earlier I talked about how when athletes train harder, fatigue goes up and vigor goes down. And, like, and so we thought it was sort of a seesaw that energy or vigor and fatigue were kind of endpoints to the same unitary continuum. But when we started looking closer and closer to these two factors, we didn't see that relationship. And this was an early study which kind of pointed this out to us. This was pre and post training. So in the morning and at the end of the day with a group of uh, highly competitive cyclists. And what we see on a day-to-day -day basis is that more or less, fatigue shows a sawtooth pattern. So at the end of the day of training, you're very fatigued. The next morning, you're back to low levels. So up and down. Whereas vigor is relatively unaffected. It's slowly going down. And it's only when it reaches a certain point that it starts showing, at least to some degree, kind of an inverse relationship. So it's like they're, they're giving different sources of information. If you had to come up with a metaphor, I'd almost say that fatigue is like, you know, if, you're, if you have an engine, it's the engine temperature. So you run the engine hard, the temperature shoots way up and then cools back down. Where vigor is almost like the gas tank. You know, it's slowly, slowly draining the gas tank and then you get to the fumes and, you know, things change. So we decided to, to combine these two uh, scales by subtracting fatigue from the bigger scale and just looking at whatever was left over. And that's our energy index. And we did this with a small sample of elite kayakers uh, using the prongs before and after daily workouts, after what we call a short recovery, which is one night rest, versus a, a long recovery, which is two nights and a day off. And then we measured some other things. So here's their weekly training schedule. And you can see they're doing a kayaking in the morning, they've got uh, running in the afternoon, another kayaking session, a long double here. So they're working very, very hard and they have one day off in the middle of the week. So we were assessing these athletes every morning and at the end of the day. And it literally took us five or six years working with these athletes and coaches before they would let us take these measures that often and uh, use them. Uh, it, it's, it's the search is slow. So there's a short assessment. So in other words, how they feel with just an overnight's worth of sleep, and then here's the long recovery. So they get overnight sleep and a day off. So we wanted to see how they recovered in these circumstances. And here are the results. So here's our energy index uh, that we won. And what we see is basically they start out with some energy at the end of the day, they're down, and they're back to where they were with a short recovery. And it's not significant, but it looks like they're getting a little bit more uh, with the longer recovery. Week two, things are changing a little. They're starting out a little bit lower, and we can see that overnight rest does not allow full recovery. Whereas overnight rest and a day off, they're getting back to where they were, but you can see they're starting out a little bit lower. And week three, the response is different again. They're, they're lower, they're down, they don't recover, they're recovering a little bit, but they're starting lower uh, at the end of that. So we're, we're, we feel that this very, very close lens, large magnifying glass, so to be looking at things very closely gives us additional information. So we can look at the athletes, how they feel in the morning, across the three weeks, we see a trend there. We can look at the athletes at the end of their practice, how they fare the next day, so we're getting a bit of different information there, the, the amount of recovery. There are a lot of ways that you can examine this, and we feel that this is another way that these psychological measures can be used to look at overtraining from the perspective of recovery. Again, they're, they're not many practical tools to get a handle.
Well, the last area <coughs> of overtraining research that I want to talk about is almost the most simple, and that's descriptive research on overtraining syndrome. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, research has shown there's roughly about a 10% seasonal incidence of overtraining syndrome, but that's just one season. You know, in, in swimming, athletes will go through a normal season and they'll do summer training and they start out again. There are other sports where they train throughout the entire year. So what we're talking about is what is the effect of compounded training over a long period of time on the risk of overtraining syndrome? So career rates of overtraining syndrome, you might call it. And uh, when I was at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Dr. Morgan and colleagues published the first two papers that tried to look at this. Surprisingly, this very old topic, almost 100 years old at that point, and nobody had asked athletes, uh, have you ever experienced overtraining syndrome over your entire career? And that's kind of a different question. And what they found was, and this was very surprising at the time, that when you look at elite adult athletes, these are elite male and female uh, long distance runners, that a lot of them had problems. <coughs> speaking more or less a two out of three. And you compare them to adult uh, runners who are not elite, and the risk is only half that. So this, I think, was very important because at that time, a lot of people thought female athletes were at greater risk of developing overtraining syndrome than men for whatever reason. When you actually look at them, there are no different risks as long as the training is comparable. The risks are essentially equal. So there is no sex-based difference. And it also was thought that, well, the elite <coughs> athlete, because of their superior physical prowess and so on, would be at less risk than the less successful athlete, but it's exactly the opposite. And the simple explanation for that was that these athletes were doing harder and more training. So these were the first published papers that really looked at the, the long-term incidences of this. And I became interested in this because, um, well, my wife was an age group swimmer, or a swimming coach, actually. And, and these kids were training. Uh, she trained them as much as uh, Doc Houseman ever trained Mark Smith. So, Children were doing uh, training loads that were comparable to Olympians just 10 or 15 years earlier. So we did a study with adolescent swimmers, 12 to 15 year olds, that across five different countries, and we asked them the same question that Dr. Morgan asked these uh, athletes earlier. Have you ever experienced uh, a bout of overtraining syndrome? We described it symptomatically, we didn't label it, um, at some point in your career. And the result was exactly the same as these are. And we were shocked by this. We thought we'd see some level, but we didn't think that it would be the same as athletes who trained twice as long. And these kids have been training maybe about seven years. We kind of didn't believe it. So then we did a study with uh, high school junior national athletes in Sweden, 13 different sports, and we found essentially the same thing again. And then I have to say, some sports psychologists said, and they were saying this exactly to me, well, retrospective recall uh, is a dubious way to gather performance data. So they didn't believe these people were telling the truth. But for me, it's like, well, why would they lie so consistently? Yeah, right? <laughs> right? And why would they, if they had this problem, why would they even admit it? So then uh, a uh, young student came to Sweden when I was doing a postdoc there, and he did a, a longitudinal study, it wasn't retrospective recall, with British age group swimmers, and found that roughly 30% of them had this problem. And then most recently, uh, these are uh, young uh, Nordic skiers in Switzerland, 30%. So I think this is remarkably consistent uh, and also somewhat alarming that you can look at young athletes and roughly speaking two out of three already in their very brief careers have experienced a bout of overtraining syndrome, at least one bout of overtraining syndrome. So that 10% rate really, I think, uh, underrepresents the, the true range and scope of this problem. And it's certainly not gonna go away because uh, people are still training athletes harder and harder. There's another aspect of this, which I think is even more important in a sense, and that is the risk is not equal across athletes. When I was at, uh, here at the University of Wisconsin, we did a very simple study. We had data on overtraining in swimmers over a long period of time. And we simply looked at the swimmers who during their freshman year of competition here in the, uh, at University of Wisconsin did not develop overtraining syndrome. So these were the healthy athletes. And we looked at them for the next three years. What we found was that by the time they're seniors, roughly a third of them had become overtrained once. 
I don't know if that's by circumstance or what, but it's sort of what we're seeing all day. What we also though found or looked at were those swimmers as freshmen who did develop overtraining syndrome. And then we looked at them for the following three years, and what we found is entirely different. Almost all of them had it again, at least once. And at least and, and many of them had it twice, if not all three seasons. So it was like at the age of 18, we're already seeing two types of athletes: those who are relatively free from the risk of overtraining syndrome, and those who season after season seem to be at higher risk. So the question then is, why are they different? Is this a constitutional or biological difference that's being manifested by the training? Or is it because of the training somehow? Because it, it suggests that you know once you get to, once you get stung, you're gonna get stung again. So that's where our research has gone more recently. We're trying to um, see if we can uncover and begin to understand why we have these sorts of, or appear to have these sorts of consistent differences among groups of athletes. And this is just a, a brief, well, we're still in the middle of this research, but what we've done is longitudinal research with a very large group of Swedish age group athletes in a variety of sports, over 500 at this point. And we measure a variety of uh, variables, including the profile of mood states, and also this Swedish version of emotional and physical exhaustion, and we've looked at them successively. And I'll just show you a, a graph of this. Is Jake here? Did Jake? Uh, I, yeah, so all right, here's our data. There you go, there's, there's all 500 of them over across three years. Uh, this is why you have to hire an epidemiologist to untangle these things. But it's very untangleable, if that's a word, because what we see is two just discrete groups. Their levels, and this was determined statistically, their, their levels of emotional exhaustion are the same here. And we see one group, roughly 90% of them, they're fine. So the two years of training has not led to any systematic <coughs> changes. But this other group, the second year, it's noticeably higher, and it gets higher again the third year. So it's, with these young athletes, it seems, well, we're starting to see these differences develop. And the questions that we're trying to now uncover are why and what's making them behave differently. You know, were they somehow different to begin with? Was there something going on with the training? And then why do they continue to have problems? And you know, I don't know if this is just circumstantial that you're, you know, it's close to that 10% that we see in a seasonal difference or what. But, um, so that's more or less where this data is going. And it started out with this very simple descriptive research, and now we're trying to look at why these individual differences show up. Well, uh, all of this, I guess you could say academically culminated a few years ago with a um, sort of a state-of-the-art paper uh, written by a number of authors on the current state of knowledge and overtraining syndrome. And this was led by Romain Yusin, uh, a name many of you will probably recognize. And uh, I was asked to be the psychologist on this. And for me, I, that was personally gratifying, but even more gratifying was that this really was an acknowledgement by the field of sports science, exercise physiology sciences, that the psychological findings were core or key to understanding <coughs> The overtraining syndrome. And uh, 20 years ago, this it would never have included any psychological information. So I feel this really is a, a big academic legacy of Dr. Morton, where his research really changed the way exercise science thinks about overtraining syndrome, uh, understands it, and more importantly, tries to prevent it. Because I would say all of these uh, sports scientists would agree if you had to choose one tool to try to keep athletes from developing overtraining, it would be some sort of a psychological or mood assessment. It wouldn't be the types of measures that they would typically rely upon. So that's been very, very gratifying to me. But there are things that I think are equally gratifying that I'd like to speak of briefly. And, and throughout the years, I've not only had um, academic opportunities provided to me by Dr. Morton, but uh, we've also got, gotten something that we call residue. His students call this residue. And let me explain what residue is. Residue is that you get to do something or go somewhere or go to a meeting because Dr. Morton can or doesn't want to. This is all, I'm sorry, I've got a conflict. Uh, can I, and he'll give it one of our names. So we take residue very seriously. It's a very positive thing. And it led to me, I've had some great experiences. So there's uh, Ralph Pathenbarger and Dilka Biori, who I got to meet. Uh, there's Fred Cash and Steve Blair at another meeting. Uh, there's Mike Pollitt, that's when I was inducted to. Uh, a fellowship at ACSM, so I've gotten to meet some uh, great people. I've gotten to go to other meetings. Uh, this most recently, this is 
International Conference on the, Psycholo uh, the Placebo Effect of Exercise and Sport. And there's Chris Beatty, who's really the world's leading sport placebo researcher. Uh, there's Fabrizio Benedici, who's probably the leading researcher on placebo period in the world. And there's Jake Menheimer, the up and coming researcher. <laughs> so that's been, and as I mentioned, I've gotten to meet uh, uh, colleagues in the area, and they don't all look like this, fortunately. Uh, oh, this is one of my postdocs, uh, Dr. Ken Pons, the University of Valencia. And uh, even more significantly in terms of legacy, uh, you know, I've uh, developed lots of friendships and colleagues through my time here at the University of Wisconsin, some of whom are here in the audience. And I think all of you are students here now, you know, and if you continue here in graduate school or go somewhere else, this will be the most rewarding legacy that you'll experience. Because you'll get to make very important friends that you get to do research and work with, do exciting things with, and those friendships will last uh, a very long time. So I want to close with a personal thank you to Dr. Morgan for uh, the many legacies which he's endowed me and, and his many students with. And thank you for your attending today.